Hey folks, have a look on Reddit or any PC forum and it's not going to be long before you find someone suggesting that changing the thermal paste will be the answer to whatever problem someone has. High temperatures, thermal paste. Low FPS, thermal paste. Intel's 10 nanometer production woes, thermal paste. The thing is though that in many cases, these people are actually right. Thermal paste is a key component to getting the heat away from a hard working piece of silicon and into the heatsink. And you might even have seen some of my Vega 64 videos where changing the stock thermal paste to something advertised as higher performance netted noticeably lower operating temperatures. But that's a high power part kicking out a lot of heat. What about something a little bit more mundane, something that only sips power, something like my GTX 1650, which draws all of its power from a single PCIe slot? Well, that's what we're going to be taking a look at today, seeing if changing the thermal paste on a new, low-powered, low-end part actually does anything. So I'll preface this by saying that when you buy a used graphics card, whether it's been used for mining in a workstation or gaming, it's always a good idea to give it a refresh. Thermal paste does dry out over time, lowering its effectiveness at transferring heat away from the GPU, but it's going to be up to you to decide, based on the card's condition, age and how it was used, how much of a cleanup it needs. But a new graphics card won't have dried out thermal paste, it's not going to be clogged up with dust and grime, and its fans will be in peak condition. So in this situation, is there anything to be gained? Well, for this test, we're going to run the GTX 1650 through a Firestrike stress test, a 10 minute loop which loads the GPU fully and measures the stability of a setup. To remove as much variance in heat dissipation capacity as we can, I've also set the GPU fan speed to a constant 65%. Now, this setup loaded over the 10 minute test should be more than enough time for the heat kicked out by the GPU and the heat dissipation capacity from the coolant setup to reach a state of equilibrium. What we should see is a gradual rise before a plateau. So let's look at our baseline with the stock paste, and predictably we see no thermal throttling. Which is good. GPU boost 3.0 does make things slightly harder to control as the clock speed is going to boost up higher when the GPU is cool compared to when it's at its steady state at the end of the test. But on the whole on this card there's not much variance between the max boost and the average. Now my setup for this test does include a slight overclock on the GPU, which allows the card to boost up to 1935MHz for a second or so at the beginning of the test, while the average clock speed levelled out to 1877 by the end of the test. At around about 5 minutes, we begin to see the telltale flutter you often see when a card reaches its steady state. For the stock paste, this was in between 60 degrees C and 61 with the absolute maximum temperature seen being 62 degrees near the end. So all in all, very cool and at 65% fan speed, it was just on the cusp of becoming audible in a closed case. So with this as a base set of data, let's see if we can improve things a little. And try to tame the utter beast that is the GTX 1650. Nvidia wants to charge you over 140 quid for this, so we're obviously going to need some of the most effective high performance paste around. Thermal Grizzly Cry or not. Okay, so jibes about the card's poor value aside, the card is, as expected, really easy to take apart. Four screws and one PWM header, and that's it. And with the heatsink and shroud removed, you can see the tiny TU117 GPU. A quick clean and a blob of cryonaut, and the diminutive GTX 1650 is back together, ready to put the cryonaut paste to work. So back into Windows and idle temperatures, well they look the same as before. Everything's working well, so I guess it's time to get that next set of data on how much the cryonaut could shave off the stock paste. And, oh dear. Instead of an improvement, what we'll actually get here is a drop in max boost clock at the start of the test down to 1920MHz and a drop in average boost clock down to 1857 and a much, much sharper rise in temperature at the start of the test. Now this setup still sees the card level out around the 5 minute mark as before, but this time it was fluctuating between 64 degrees C and 65, rather than the 60 to 61 we've seen at stock, along with a peak temperature jumping up a few degrees to 65. Conditions were the same, room temperatures the same, fan speed the same, so what's different? Well, although Thermal Grizzly Cryonaut doesn't have a cure in time per se, meaning it's essentially ready to go out of the tube, that doesn't mean that the application doesn't need some time to settle in. Something that's often overlooked. So when sorting out the thermal challenges with my Vega 64 cards, I noticed much better performance with the Thermal Grizzly Cryonaut for sure, 
but only after it had been thermally cycled a few times and given the time to settle in. So I've got a funny feeling that it's going to be the same case here. Ok, so I've been owned in a few rounds of Battlefield 5 at this point, and also plotted out how I'm going to pillage my wallet in the next Steam sale. So now the system has been cycled and allowed to cool down to the same idle temperatures as before, let's rerun the test and see what happens. This time we get much more favourable results compared to the previous run. With the settled Thermal Grizzly paste we do see a tangible improvement over stock, it's not by much. But on a point in time basis, it was consistently around 1 degree C cooler than stock, maxing out at 61 degrees C, and returning a peak clock speed at the start of the test over 1940 MHz while also having a higher average clock speed over the length of the test, even if it was only by a few MHz. So what can we take from this little endeavour? Well, firstly don't waste expensive thermal paste on low end hardware. A 1 degree difference between a stock application and one of the highest rated pastes around, that's less than 1.7% difference, and in my opinion, that's well within the margin of error for a test like this. So as big a difference as it made on a car like Vega which kicks out an insane amount of heat with a massive heatsink. On a power stripping card like the 1650, a cheap bulk buy paste like MX2 is going to work perfectly well. You're most definitely not going to be unlocking more headroom to see tangible performance boosts, thanks to GPU boost for example by spending extra money on a high end paste. Secondly, if you change up the thermal paste to the components in your system, just remember that there might be some benefit to leaving your PC on idle or just using it normally while it settles back into its groove rather than simply jumping straight into a torture test, especially if you're intending to run benchmarks or test out various pastes. If you don't, you run the risk of basically benchmarking your application of paste rather than the performance of the paste itself. And thirdly, well if you're still here, well done. This video it was only in existence because it was one of those rare moments that a thought popped into my head and I ended up making a video on it. I usually keep these off the cuff little experiments off the channel. So cheers for sticking around. But you know what, I'm going to leave it there. Let me know what your best thermal paste tips are or horror stories, and where you would draw the line when it comes to using expensive thermal paste. But folks, take care, and I'll see you in the comment section down below, and in the next video.